He's Howard Eibach, former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 27 years of experience. Together, we are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about the creative brief, briefing, and advertising. We're back for another episode, Henry. Today, I'm really excited to, to uh, let you all know that our guest is named Jim Melzer. He's coming to us from, from New Mexico, and he has a background in something that we really haven't talked about before, which makes his insights, I think, truly, truly valuable. Let's join the conversation. Henry, we're back with another episode, and I'm delighted to introduce to you and our wide audience a gentleman by the name of Jim Melzer. He is coming to us from, you're in Arizona now, right, Jim? I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Well, I was close. I was in Santa, I was in Phoenix the last two weeks, so I flew over you to get, okay. to, to, get to Phoenix. Uh, Jim reached out to me on LinkedIn, as some people are want to do. Uh, with a, and we started a conversation about briefs. And I think, Henry, one of the things we can say about Jim is that he's one of us. He's a devotee of briefs. So we're going to have a fun conversation. We'll have a hard time coming to a complete stop because I'm sure we'll keep the conversation going. What Jim did is he sent me a, a PowerPoint that he used to a presentation at a local chapter of the American Advertising Federation, uh, a group I'm familiar with. I'm a member of my chapter here in Austin. And I spoke to the Phoenix group uh, last week, and he uses this. At, he used this at that time to uh, talk about the value of a brief, and he has since used it for educational purposes for clients, and and that he's worked for other ad agencies or on his own. And we may show you a couple examples. We may drop a couple of pages from that PowerPoint into our uh, episode. Henry is our master editor. Um, but uh, the highlight of this of this PowerPoint that's got me so jazzed about wanting to talk to you, Jim, um, we'll get into in a minute. But first, I want you to tell us a little bit about you. Um, you've been in the business for quite a while. You've worked at a number of top agencies. Let me start by asking a question we, we kind of like to ask others. What got you into the business? What, what attracted you? to advertising. And what has your path been? Yeah, what's your path? Well, I, uh, I have a degree in advertising, but I also have a degree in agriculture. And um, I grew up on a farm and I always wanted to work in some part of agriculture, but I didn't really want to farm. And I didn't really want to go into the more science end of it. So I discovered that there was this thing called agricultural advertising. And so that's that's kind of a, a specific niche I pursued, and uh, it's really been quite quite good for me. Uh, and and even even lately, it's been very good because uh, agriculture still uses uh, a lot of traditional media. Farmers still read a lot of magazines in the evening. They watch the evening news on TV. They uh, religiously listen to the to the farm markets to find out the price of corn and soybeans and hogs and cattle and so you can do a lot of radio with uh, the egg segment as well so still doing you know good brand advertising so and uh, so I've, I've kind of been on that path and I've worked at oh the biggest egg agencies in the country in uh, Chicago and uh, Michigan and Minneapolis. And then uh, I was working at an agency in Minneapolis and they um, they decided to uh, make some changes, if you will. And so then I started freelancing. That was about 15 years ago. And since then I've, I've again, worked for uh, some of the largest ag, worked on some of the largest ag accounts in the country, sometimes $50 million pieces of business. As a strategist, as a, as a creative or as an account person? Yeah, um, I was a copywriter and then became uh, a creative director. And uh, I guess my feeling was uh, that a lot of good strategy came from the creative department. And uh, eventually, uh, I was at an agency where the creative department pretty much took over the job of, of writing creative briefs, which I think 
you could just as well call them strategy briefs as far as I'm concerned. That is in the way that it directs creative. So yeah, I've been I've been in this business a long time and I've I've seen I've seen a lot of transitions as you guys have. Bef yeah. Before we get uh into the brief and stuff, I, I just think that it's interesting what you mentioned at the top about ag advertising. Uh, having last year uh been one of the judges of the Nebraska Addies, I can I can attest uh, to the fact the amount of work uh frankly the amount the amount the amount of work that is um hold on my phone is ringing that's uh, not convenient um so we didn't uh, hear it fortunately yeah um the, the the amount of work the volume of work that exists out there is, and i think for all of us that work in advertising like especially those of us that live on the coast it's a good reminder of the millions and millions of people that live in this country that don't necessarily live the way we do, that don't have the me same media consumption trends that we do, that don't have the same values uh, or may not have the same values uh, that we do, you know, in LA and New York, uh, you know, and, and in the big city. So I, I just wanted to stop and, and reflect on that a little bit. Yeah. And, and I think, um, Farmers have gotten a lot more sophisticated. They, you know, their farms are bigger. Uh, they're spending millions of dollars on inputs. Many of them, um, you know, ha have college degrees. They may have taken over from a father or a grandfather. And these are sharp cats. Mm -hmm. And uh, they appreciate and get good creative. And they will tell you when it sucks. I'm I'm one of the reasons that that I was intrigued by you reaching out to me and how much I appreciated you reaching out to me, Jim, was the fact that you have this background. I dabbled in a number of accounts in, early in my career and have won some awards from the National Agri-Marketers Association. Uh, I've worked on a couple of accounts that were ag related and in, in a small B2B shop in Milwaukee called uh, the Ken Schmidt Company, which I is- know of them. I don't know if that's still their name. Ken has long since, I think he's passed on. He's retired. I think he's retired, retired, and then he passed on. I think he handed it off to his son or a family member. But I spent a couple of years there. We did some really good, fun work. I think the creative opportunities, speaking now not as a brief writer or brief expert, but as a former copywriter, I think creative opportunities are vast uh, for these kinds of brands because they're not perceived for to being sexy and that's precisely what attracts me to them is because let me let me have fun with this kind of a brand right i think and, they're and nice they're a nice combination of b2b and consumer these guys are still big businessmen but yeah. they're still everyday people that have families and uh, you know go to softball games and whatever and and they're not ceos but they sort of are but they're 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 um they're very accepting of of good creative. Yeah, I found that to be the case too. And and so we have the same challenges and problems in writing a good brief for an ag account as we do for you know a major consumer account. Um, so you you were attracted to the business because you you like to think, you like to write, you're a creative, you're a creative person. Um, what was there some moment in this in your career track that you woke up to how valuable the brief was? Is there like, was there an aha moment for you or did you just sort of ease your way into it? Well, I was at an agency in Minneapolis um, that was not using a uh, creative brief. And uh, we hired a couple of Let's guys. Let's not name them. Came. Let's not name no, them, no. right? We won't. <laughs> we, we hired a couple of guys, people away from a, a bigger shop and they were kind of um, appalled that an agency our size didn't have that kind of process. So they sold it to management and we had a, a big, uh, you know, day long seminar and lights came on everywhere. And uh, it, it just occurred to us that my goodness, we've been working so inefficiently and we've been wasting time and we've gone through multiple rounds with, of, of creative with clients because they didn't know where they wanted to go. We didn't know where we wanted to go. And 
it wasn't that you know we weren't meeting their expectations. We were. It just took us a long time to get there. But with the brief process, it just it just made things so much, you know, like I say, more efficient. It led to better work, and you spent far less time fooling around with bad ideas. Um, you just you were able to zero in on things much faster. And, and instead of creating, you know, 10 concepts on this strategy, 10 concepts on this strategy, you created 20 or 30 on one strategy. So mm-hmm. you had much more on target work to pick from so that in that way you could go, well, let's go with this tone or this tone or humor or intellect or, but they were all on strategy. And that that's the real value of the brief that you land somewhere before you start, you know, building a bunch of hours. Did you find the clients that you were working with at that particular agency bought into this idea? Was there a bit of a learning curve or was there a bit of a buy-in curve with them as well? Or did they, were they even told and made aware? Yeah, good, good, yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, they were made aware mostly because we wanted to charge them for it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I've, uh, ran across clients who said, oh, we don't have time to do a creative brief and we can't afford mm-hmm. to do a creative brief. And the truth of the matter is you can't afford not to. Not to. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's, it, that, that's an interesting um, point because it, it was the case that at the, um, with the rise of account planning in the United States, Um, agencies wanted to have this tool. They heard about it in the UK, how great it was. Um, Somebody who would write the briefs and attend the research and kind of be living in both the agency world, but also in the client's business world. Um, But it was a new person. It was an incremental body that was going to be working on an account and somebody had to pay for that. And that somebody was the client. So I'm not surprised. I don't think it's necessarily that they wanted to, the the brief itself was the issue of pay. It's that in order to write a brief, you need somebody who's really good at writing briefs. Usually, it's somebody specializes in that, and that person that's one of the main roles of a strategist or a planner. Um, and that was, you know, through the '90s and the early 2000s, I think there was a lot of debate and question mark about, you know, should clients not wanting to pay for strategy. I think they pretty much now accept the fact that they're when they award business to an agency that among the creatives that they hire, they're hiring and among the account people that they're hiring, there's also a strategist going to be involved. Yeah. And I, and I think in some cases, uh, account people and creative people started getting more in tune to that, you know, discipline of account planning And in our case, we got to the point where we didn't think we needed one. I think we had enough uh, smart types around that that, uh, we we didn't really need that specialized person. Plus, we had a lot of people uh, that worked on ag and maybe came from farm backgrounds. So we could uh, convince the client that we knew their business, Mm. technical side of their business pretty well. So then we just added the, the, the creative end and the strategy end. And they kind of, and some of these clients had worked with account planners, but you know, when they came well, on, when we I, won an account, they saw what we had. I just want to tag on. I agree with you completely that having a strategist or a planner is not necessary to have a good brief writing mechanism, right? If you have an account person who's strategic knows the client's business, understands the importance of a brief. There's no reason why an account person can't write a brief. There's no reason why a creative can't write a brief. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so I'm not advocating for strategists as a profession must be in an agency. But I think that we all agree having a good brief writer among your staff that's working on an account is important. I think, Henry, you've always emphasized to having people who are strategic in their thinking, whether they're strategists by definition is not as important because you point out that some creatives are more strategic than others. And, and that's why, you know, I, what, what, 
you know, I think impresses me about Jim, what you've been doing is that you're an example of one of these creatives. And we've had a couple of them on our show before who have this approach, this bent. I, I'm, you know, when I get a question or when I get a, a request from the account person, my first question is why? Which, you know, sometimes upsets the account person because the account person basically wants you to just to, to, to deliver. And we, yeah. we know those types. But the creative who stops and says, why is the one who's starting to think? Henry, Henry pointed this out to me. I, I never really thought of myself as all that strategic, even though I'm writing all this stuff about briefs. And he said, Howard, you, you, you're the first person to ask why. And that's an indication of someone who is strategic in their thinking. Well, that's how, that's how I got into strategy was I was always asking why. Like, client wants to do this, blah, 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 blah. Why? Why do they want to do that? Because when I understand the motivation, then I can determine whether that's the right approach or not, or maybe we should be ideating something else. We should be thinking in, in another way. Like just because the client thinks that X, Y, and Z is going to solve their problem doesn't necessarily, we're the experts. That's what we're there for. Right. So asking why just came natural to me because I'm a contrarian and, and, <laughs> and, and I, and I like, you know, but I also, it's part of me wanting to really solve the client's problem rather than yeah. just take, take the client's order. So, so Jim, let's, let's, let's talk about you. You got into this thing that about briefs and, and you said lights went on. Um, that's what happened to me too. Uh, was there a process when you were learning about how this is going to help you, you and your department do a better job, when you said, well, there's a difference between an okay brief, a bad brief, and a good brief? Was, was there an aha moment for that as well? Well, we, um, like I said, we had this um, seminar and we went through a brief. And um, to me, it was the uh, sequential order of building the brief that really uh, struck me as something strategic. It's like building a case uh, for a lawyer. You start out with the kind of the known things, the kind of the things that the client would know and the account people would know and the creatives would know. And then you start drilling down and you, you start asking more pertinent questions. You start asking more emotional questions. And pretty soon by this time, you're getting heads to nod and then you come in with what we used to call the compelling promise, which could be the, you know, the one thing, whatever you want to call it. And by that time, people are going, oh, I see. You went from these are the people we're trying to reach. Here's what they believe. Here's what their problems are. And here's how our product or service can solve that problem and, and make them feel more comfortable take their worries away, things like that. We tried to load the uh, compelling promise with emotional language rather than just technical features. It's like, here's an emotional benefit. If you're a farmer buying an expensive piece of equipment, you can have peace of mind that this is going to work for you and it's going to provide return on investment. If you're a purchasing agent at a, at a big industrial company, you don't have to worry about getting canned because we can help you mm. solve your problems. So I guess it was what, what made writing briefs become, um, you know, a passion and, and became fun was this, this uh, process of, of getting down to that, that emotional problem that we could solve for. Uh, yeah. See, Henry, I told you, this is, this guy's a brief brother at, at heart. So we've yeah. got another, we've got another one. <laughs> I, 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 I want to go down another little tangent that you opened the door to, which was you were talking about some of the motivations and you mentioned the farmer and then you mentioned like the purchasing guy at yeah. a company. And the reason I bring it up is, so my wife has been working at a B2B agency for the last five years, but before that she had been working on a B2C agency, like, like I had her whole career. And um, it, it was interesting, her coming from the B2C world, she quickly recognized that a lot of people in the B2B world don't recognize the human nature of 
the B2B client, like that they have emotional aspirations. They have things they're trying for, striving for, things that they don't want to happen, like get canned for buying the wrong thing. And so I, I, I think one of the reasons she's been successful and she has been successful these last five years is that she's brought a little bit of that deeper thinking about the consumer that in this case is a business, but underlying the, that there is a consumer, um, you know, at the end, we're all human, right? Like all these decisions are, are being made by humans. So I kind of, I'm, I'm, I was acknowledging and nodding along with, with what you were saying as you were giving the example. Why don't we use this? I think, I think ahead, everybody ahead, that Jim. works, everybody that works in a business or is part of a business has emotional thoughts about their work. You, like you said, Henry, you, they're humans. It's not all cut and dried. It's not all bean counting. It's like, well, something can happen if I don't buy the right product, use the right product, use the right service, and it could be emotionally, you know, a problem for me. Yep. The other thing that you said that I really identified with was the emotional nature of the compelling promise or the single-minded proposition, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the features, benefits, which, you know, in a good brief, I think have their place in the evidence or reasons to believe section of a brief, as long as they do support that compelling promise like we, i've seen briefs where there's a gazillion reasons to believe but they don't all ladder back to the compelling promise yeah. which i would consider an unforced error on the on the brief writer or possibly just you know a client wanting to dump a bunch of stuff into yeah. a brief to make sure they cover their ass um but uh i, I de- definitely identified with that aspect of of your answer as well why don't we use this as a chance to uh, segue into Jim's PowerPoint? We don't go through the whole thing, but there are some really cool examples of uh, your work and the brief that I think are worth discussing. Before I show it, I'm going to do a little screen share. Mm. Uh, you, as I was inter- saying at the introduction, this was a presentation you made to, uh, was it the New Mexico chapter? Mexico Advertising Federation, yep. What was the, was this your idea? Did they invite you to come and talk? What, how, how did this happen? How did it come together? Well, I moved from uh, Colorado where I was uh, involved with the Ad Fed Club there. And then as soon as I got to New Mexico, I joined the club here. And I, I was a mentor to a college student who became a young professional who was still taking my advice. And uh, so I, I kind of ingratiated myself with the chapter. And then I suggested that they do uh, uh, a webinar. They, we were still in the height of COVID, a webinar on the creative brief. And and I wanted to do it because I, I just think there's a lot, of, a lot of young creatives that haven't been introduced to a brief and may not have worked at a large enough agency that had that function so and i could kind of sense the what the market was like and how many people were doing good work that may or may not have come from a brief so that's i kind of i kind of invited myself to do to do the presentation well good for you i'm glad you did because i i find it valuable now i i'm going to start off on kind of in in the uh not quite the middle but kind of a couple of of slides in. Um, I wanted to start with what a creative brief isn't. So let me just do a screen share and we'll take a look. A creative brief is not. It's not a job order done by an account guy to make sure a project gets started. It's not a marketing document from the client to make sure you don't forget about their business needs. It's not a knowledge dump from the client or agency research department. I read through this and I was like, yes, 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 yes. This is This is like... We know we're told you got to have this, you got to have this, you got to have this, but it's nice to hear what the opposite is. What do we don't want? What do we not need? Yeah, I've worked at agencies where they, the production department gave you a, a folder with a job number on it. And when it was due and it's like, go to work. Oh, no, <laughs> stop. 
<laughs> that isn't enough. And you, know, and you also get, you know, if you don't go through the translation process from marketing objectives to communications objectives, then you get marketing speak, you get sales objectives, you get awareness, maybe you get some media thrown in, but you don't get, you don't get a document that helps uh, creative people go to work. Start well, your job. Longtime listeners of the Brief Brothers uh, viewers will will identify with me. You know, basically saying these things in different words. You know, what, it's one of the reasons why my preference has always been, if I can get away with it, to write, take the client's communication brief and write our creative brief, and not even trouble the client with showing it to them or having them approve it because they want it. They there's an inertia in a lot of these big institutions to make it a, a marketing document, to make it a knowledge dump, to cover their ass and to make these things, you know, the, much less powerful than what they can be. Um, and so I actually found a memo recently that I, I wrote uh, internally at an agency that I was at working for a big client at the time and, you know, in, in different words, I ex expressed some of my frustration with, like, how the client was perverting the creative brief. And it was basically these three things uh, all in one. So um, I, you know, this was when Howard sent me the deck. I was, like, looking through it. I'm like, yeah, the, a man after my own heart. Yeah, one of the things that I can do in my training that Henry probably can't do or maybe would, would just shy away from doing is that I can show my trainees examples of really good briefs. And we can talk about what makes them good by saying what's not there. What, why, is the, why are the things that you would expect to see in a typo, typical brief not on these briefs? And of course, the answer is because this is what the creatives don't need. This is, what we're seeing here is exactly what the creatives need, what they ask for, what they crave, and the other stuff is just not there because it's not meant for them. It's meant for the marketers. It's meant for the, the client. Um, and Henry would have a hard time doing that because, you know, that's kind of, a, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Henry, but I just think that would be off target. Not, not, not what you're trying to do when you're doing a, a, you know, writing a brief and presenting work from that brief. Would you agree with me? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, if, I were, if I were teaching a workshop, I would definitely talk about these points and I might show briefs that have stuff and, you know, we try to find good briefs to share and to, you know, to react to, but, you know, bad briefs are instructive too. I mean, you could redline yes. a, a bad brief and say, why is this whole section on marketing objectives even here? Like, why don't we go right to communication objectives? Um, or if you're, if you want to talk, sometimes I, I talk about a marketing objective, but not in the sense of a number or a KPI to hit, but say, we want to grow sales, but here's the barrier to the communication barrier to those sales. Now, here's the, the, the communication objective that will help us alleviate that barrier and get ultimately to sales but saying you want to increase sales by five percent that doesn't help a copywriter like how the how the fuck am i gonna increase sales by five percent pardon my yeah French. it's gonna be a headline we want you we want you to go out and buy more stuff because our client wants us to wants to increase sales by five percent that's a buy, killer headline buy five percent more of this stuff my <laughs> jo my job depends on it yeah yeah advertising yeah, I, by it, guilt. it would be fun it would be fun <laughs> if you had the courage uh, to do some layouts like that after receiving a brief that says the uh, the uh, objective here is to increase sales. And then you write, you show them a, a layout that says, buy more of our shit. We need the money. <laughs> Let's be know, honest. I, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do a series of LinkedIn posts and I'll give you guys credit, but I exactly that. Like, this is what an ad would look like. Like, you know, if you it, please buy 5% of our, my creative brief said I must. <laughs> my, well, I have a running joke in my workshop where I say, I live to see a brief that says sales are too hot. We need to cool things off. That's the objective, right? Okay. Let me keep going. I, I, I just love this. Um, 
I'm going to just jump ahead and, and show you here. Here's an example of, this is from your brief. Yeah. Right. So this is for Outlook herbicide. I remember we, I remember, I remember this product. I don't, I don't think I ever worked on it, but I remember the product. So this is your, what did you call it on your brief, Jim? Compelling oh, promise. Compelling promise. I liked it. I've heard all and, kinds of descriptions of the single minor proposition, but compelling promise is right up there. And I, I think, um, I don't know where I have it, but I think there's a, it says compelling promise, and then there's a little language that goes with it. And it, it, it's very clear that you're supposed to be talking about an emotional benefit in this part of the brief. That and might be, might be up in your, in, in your description of the briefs, which probably I on the, it's probably on the brief itself. Yeah. Well, here it says, you can be confident that Outlook will provide superior weed control and make your fields look great. Yeah, and the, so there's two, I think there's two emotional benefits there. You can be confident mm -hmm. because planting crops and making the investment of seed and herbicide and plant nutrition is expensive. So there's, there's, all, there's one emotional benefit in there, confidence. And then that back end of it is, you know, this is where this is where farmers are still people. Pride. They want to have a good looking field for the neighbors. Of course, a good looking yeah. field also means they're going to have less weeds and they're going to have better crops. But there's also that little emotional benefit of, you know, yeah, Jim, I drove by your uh, your back 40 there last night uh, or yesterday afternoon. Looks looks good. OK. Yeah. It's an emotional. It's like, it's, yeah, it's like for for Joe consumers like Henry and me. It's about our yard. I don't have a yard, and I don't know if Henry has a yard. But you know, it used to be, if you didn't cut your yard, you heard about it from your neighbors, not necessarily directly, but yeah. indirectly. You know, it's it's funny because I rent, and our landlord is responsible for the for the exterior and the lawn and all that. And we have a weed problem, and I periodically have to text her and say, <laughs> you know. The weeds are getting higher than the grass here. They're outnumbering them. You know, is there something we could do about this? So I can totally relate to that. Let's take a look at the, this. Is this this was the, the the compelling idea? Here's the ad. No, maybe no herbicide can make you feel completely confident. Extremely cocky, however, is a possibility. God, I love that. And this that is a guy <laughs> going in to the local <laughs> coffee shop where, yeah, where he's going to hear from his neighbors. Absolutely. That's where all the stuff goes down. That That's great. And it is hitting on both emotional benefits. Like you mm -hmm. say, now we can't make you completely cut, but we can get you enough so that you're going to be cocky. So it's really paying off on both. Let me just read the copy here. The active ingredient in new outlook herbicide for corn is more active. That means superior, longer lasting grass control and better broadleaf weed control than with other uh, pre-emergence of corn herbicides in wet or dry conditions in all tillage systems without leaching all backed by our exclusive performance card so you've got a lot of good information there but you've got that emotional hook in the headline yeah that that's the uh, reasons to believe yeah and, and yeah. that's i think this, this is this is classic hard to get, it's hard to get everything into a headline yeah uh, but you don't you don't want to you don't want to you've got the you've got the detail you've got the information in the body copy you know we had a, a guest on a, very early on it was lance saunders who was the strategist at campbell methune i don't know if you ever knew lance no nope. he went on to become the the chief operating officer at ddb canada but um he is he likes to say facts tell emotions sell so you've got the facts that the farmer wants yeah. to know here but you've got that emotional hook in the headline. So good stuff. Right. And and I think after reading a headline like that, the the farmer, the grower, whatever you want to call them, is gonna go, show me. Yeah. Well, there you go. A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z. That's the job of the headline, right? Yeah. Along with the image is to draw you in to the things that are supposed to make a difference, right? Uh, the why, why should I, but anybody can make a promise, yeah. but can you convince me that that promise is based on something? So I, I, while the the headline is emotional, the body copy in this case is very rational. Um, 
to support why mm-hmm. you can, you know, have these feelings if this is something you desire, which as a farmer, I could see uh, why they would want to be desiring. Uh, and, and, and the question I would ask is, does this add answer or address the brief? And it absolutely, this is the brief. It absolutely does. Yeah. You know, Sir John Haggerty liked to say, when I look at a brief and when he mean, when he says brief, he means this line, basically. He says, I take this line and I put it on a piece of paper blank piece of paper and above it or below it, I put a picture of the product and I put that on the wall. My first question is, okay, is this a good ad? And I would say, is this a good communication? Cause there are lots of things that we could call an ad, an ad like thing. Yep. And Sir John says, it doesn't have to be great. It just has to be good because then I ask the question, can I make this better? If I can make it better than I know I've got the beginnings of it's a right. good brief and I've got right. the beginnings of a, you know, some thinking. I always, I always tell people that a, a, a really good customer promise, compelling promise, whatever you want to call it, should sound like a pretty good headline. And then you go from there. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at another one. This is for distinct herbicide. Now you don't have to go through the hassle of using a complicated and expensive combination weed killer to get the control you need. Okay. All right. Yeah. Is that me, a, is that before, a, you, is that before a, you show the ad, let me let me. Um, sometimes I worry that these agricultural uh, uh, um, examples are aren't clear to everybody. The thing is, sometimes you have to, depending on what the crop is, do uh, a big mixture of stuff, a tank mix they call it, where you do you put stuff in the tank before the crop comes up, and then you spray again after the crop is up. And so there's pre-emergence and post-emergence and, and they came up with this product that kind of eliminated some of that. So that's Interesting. What, what it means by, uh, you don't have to go through the hassle of a complicated expenses, blah, blah, blah. Well, the thing that impresses me about all this, Jim, because it reminded me of the time when I worked you know, on some B2B accounts, is that this is technical stuff. This is complicated stuff. And the job of the strategist, which Henry knows, is to take complicated stuff and reduce it and to make it simple and clear because creatives are craving clarity. Henry has said many times, if I can't write an inspiring brief, my first objective is to write a clear brief and creatives can work with a clear brief, right? So here we've got some complicated stuff attached to a not very simple product. And I think it's been, and reduction, it's, you know, it's a brief is an example of strategic reduction. Yep. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean making it simplistic, but making it understood. And I think this does that job. Let's take a look at what you came up with. Complicated problem, simple solution. <laughs> yeah. And then, you, cool. you know, you have a little definition of what the safety pin is. Now, this has got um, Greek Greek copy, but the headline, I think, the question is, does the headline answer this? I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, because you've got a Greek, the farmer is going to say, okay, like you said before, Jim, show me. Right. But, but, you know. Believe me, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in the client's uh, files and email, there is all of the uh, body copy that you'll ever yeah. need, or at least the the source of the body copy. Right. And the client is going to say, I'm sorry, we need about four times as much room for the body copy. Hire David Ogilvy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> write you four paragraphs. Right, right. I remember the first time my art director, we, we came up with it. The first time my my art director said, I've got room for 50 words and you've got 500, cut it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's called copy fitting, get used to it. Ah, okay. I, I used to work with an art director who told you how many A senders and D senders she wanted. Because <laughs> she, she was using a particular font that right. the, the J's and the F's just weren't working. I, have, I haven't heard that term in a long, long time. That's pretty funny. <laughs> That's great. No okay, F words. Well, yeah. no F words. Yeah. <laughs> or, or J words. Okay, DeKalb Sorghum. And you got to be impressed that I know how to pronounce that. Yes. Uh, 
uh, you can trust that the Calb sorghum hybrids will handle the most severe tropical pest and weather conditions. Is it the Calb or is it the Cab? The guy, yeah, it depends if you're in Georgia or, or Illinois. Again, just a little background. Sorghum is what you raise when the conditions aren't good enough to raise corn. Mm. So it's like south of Nebraska and, you know, southwest, southeast. So it's, you know, you don't get enough rain. You get too much sun. You, you get too much drought. You get too much pests. So your sorghum has to be... Um, able to handle those conditions. Yeah, see, right now, all of our viewers on the coast are saying, yeah, but where's my social justice campaign? That's what I want right. to work on. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's like, you cut your teeth on this kind of thing, you can do anything. By the yep. way, th these advertisers have millions of dollars to spend. Absolutely. And, Absolutely, and, and, they do. And, and people are living, making a living, selling these products and uh, making a living using these products. Well, here's, a, here's, a, here's another, um, here's another um, support for the brief. If you have, you know, 10, $200 billion and you're a, um, you know, Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, you, you, you can run ads day and night and day and night and night and day. But if you're an agricultural company and you, you, you only have a, media budget of $100,000, you can't afford to run crap. I mean, right. every time somebody sees that ad, it has to make a really good impression. Well, that's I, a really good point. I like to say, you know, great creative is a multiplier of your media budget, mm -hmm. right? Like yep. it gets it gets noticed, it gets passed around um, and uh, it gets talked about. All of those things don't happen with mediocre creative. I, the analogy I use is if I wanted to uh, drive a nail into that wall back there and I noticed that one of the paintings is crooked and it's driving me crazy. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if, um, if I wanted to drive a nail, I could take like my shoe and like bang it enough times that the nail's going to, but if I had a heavy hammer, I hit it one time and it's going to go right in. And yeah. good creative is, is that hammer shot. Like, you know, um, and you're right. I think that's why a lot of big B2C brands, leading brands are so conservative in their advertising. They're just using, you know, their media might and muscle to overwhelm the consumer and make their brands famous that way, rather than making them famous through a more, you know, uh, uh, efficient approach. Let's take a look at the... Uh... It's a little hard to read here. Let me see. It says of tougher hammers. Than, tougher than nails. Shoot, our sorghum is tougher than hammers. Yeah, speaking that, of that hammers is, and nails. Yeah, speaking yeah. of hammers and nails. Yeah. That's that's great. That's clever. And then I can't quite read the copy, but you nah, it's a it's a it's mostly a factoids. Yeah. Yeah. And listen, we I think we got time for one more here. Let's it do ends with Oh, the you have a favorite, do you have make a sure you have the right tools for the job. I can read that. Okay. Do you have a, do you want me to jump ahead? Would you have a favorite here uh, of, the, of the, the remaining? Uh, this, I like this one. Let's just do this one. All right. Solitude fly spray. Now pay attention to this line here. Now you don't have to worry about your horse sweating off your fly spray during serious com competitions. So yeah, this, this is for rodeo the, fans. The thing there was uh, people you would put fly spray on their horse and put it out in the pasture and they'd go, well, that horse is covered. It's, you know, it's, it's going to graze and it's going to relax and whatever. But then we, we asked the client, well, if, if this fly spray won't wash off with the rain, will it also not wash off from sweating? And they went, yeah. So we all of a sudden transitioned the uh, the product from being a pasture horse product to a competitive horse product, mm. and the beauty there was that everybody thinks their horse is a is a competitive horse, and everybody's you know whether you're in a little 4-H show or not, they they still want to be competitors and they still want to be like the pros. So I, I like this example because we we sort of elevated the product and not just elevated their advertising. That's really, that's really, really smart. 
Yeah, let's take a look. Amazing photograph. Yeah. When the, when the sweat is flying, it's comforting to know your fly spray isn't. And solitude, the fly spray that won't sweat off. Right. It's a gorgeous photograph. Yeah, we did uh, we did one for English and we did one for Western because they are, you know, the, the people that ride horses and own horses will will tell you there's an absolute difference. So okay. We use the same headline, the same body copy. Why why <laughs> not? Oh, it's, yeah. it's, as, ostensibly it's the same problem, right? Like the horse right. sweats. Right. Yeah, exactly. And there's 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 Western high level Western competitions, cutting horses, reining horses, and there's high level English hunter jumper, dressage, etc. So it works both ways. Well, Jim, this has been wonderful. I'm so glad you could uh, grab some time to join Henry and me on the Brief Brothers. We, we, we love your dedication and approach to the Brief and the fact that it matters so much to brands that people you wouldn't think about, uh, or people wouldn't think about that are necessarily caring and you know, farmers out there in, in, the, in the middle of our country um, and how powerful the brands you built using good strategic thinking. And Thank you. I, I, and I'll tag on that. In addition to the conversation about the brief, I, I think it's always refreshing to talk about categories that people in our sphere don't think about yep. um, because they're very real. Um, they're very important to the people that work and, and use uh, the products. And, you know, it's a reminder that we need to be humble about, you know, a lot of the things out there that we don't see every day that exist uh out there that frankly make our lives possible like these farmers are the salt of the earth people out there that mm -hmm. because of them that we can go to trader joe's and find stuff you know exactly so jim melzer thank you for being a guest on the brief brothers we really appreciate it thank you very much it's been my pleasure good stuff henry good stuff howard he's henry gomez and he's Howard Eibach, and together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.